On our broadcast tonight, a passenger ferry with over 450 people on board sinks off the coast of Korea's southwestern Jeollanam-do province, killing four and leaving scores of others missing. For the first time ever, Korea and Japan open official talks on settling their differences over Japan's sexual enslavement of Korean women during World War II. Plus, Russian President Vladimir Putin warns Ukraine is on the verge of civil war after Kiev launches military action against pro-Russian separatists in eastern Ukraine. These stories and more next on Arirang News at 8. Thank you for joining us. It's Wednesday, April 16th here in Seoul, and I'm Choi Yusun. We start off with the sinking of a passenger ferry off the southwestern coast of Korea earlier on this Wednesday. The, there were over 450 people on board, about 320 of which were students traveling with teachers on their way to the resort island of Jeju. The Coast Guard has confirmed at least four deaths so far, and we have our Park Ji-won in the studio to give us more details. ji -won? Hi, Yusan. Well, the Sewolho ferry started to sink at around 9 this morning, some 20 kilometers off the coast of the Jindo Island. Well, four people have been confirmed so far, including a 22-year-old ferry employee, Park ji -young, and a male high schooler uh, who was on board because of the school trip, and two other males who have not yet been identified. So far, the number of people rescued stands at around 160, with the remaining 290 or so people still missing, and the search operation is still going on. Well, Chiwon, now finding them safely seems like a race against time. Right. How is the uh, rescue operation uh, coming along at this point? Yes, the government is in all-out rescue operations. Um, by employing 72 ships and 18 aircrafts, along with hundreds of specialized forces and uh, scuba divers are actively searching for survivors. <laughs> President Park Geun-hye and Defense Minister Kim Guan jin have ordered that all Navy, Coast Guard and nearby vessels help with the efforts. The Coast Guard particularly sent a rescue team of 40 people into the sunken vessel starting 5 p.m. to find trapped survivors. However, rescue operations are expected to be difficult as the tidal currents are intensifying. So, uh, ji -won, can you give us some details of the time when the ferry actually started to sink? Yes, you saw survivors say the heavy fog was in the morning and they didn't know whether the ferry would start uh, would set off this morning. It was around 8.30 that the ferry decided to set off, but it wasn't long after the passengers uh, heard a loud bang sound uh, and the ship suddenly started to tilt by 60 degrees. So let's listen to what the survivors say about the moment. The waves were calm when the ferry set off. Then all of a sudden the ship felt like it flipped on its side violently. People were cornered and they couldn't get out of their cabins because they couldn't open the doors. The ship tilted by 60 degrees and slowly inclined to 90 degrees before capsizing and that was when I was rescued. I screamed for 30 to 40 minutes in the ferry. Things were falling and people were sliding down the ship. Well, considering it happened earlier in the day and the rescuers arrived there pretty early, uh, what's taking so long to um, locate the missing people? Well, experts say if the ship tilts by more than six, like just 30 degrees, the people cannot move around. But in this case, a uh, ship tilted by more than 60 degrees suddenly. So experts say that many people have been trapped in the ship because they couldn't open the doors, and it seems that caused more people trapped in their cabin. The Coast Guard also say there's high possibility that uh, because power was cut off suddenly after the ship tilted. 
And early on, the reported number of the rescued was much higher uh, in the day, giving some hope to families of the missing people. Why was there a sudden change in the figure? Yes, up until 3 in this afternoon, the um, number of rescued people was known, uh, by, uh, known to be around 368. And it was um, at 4, the government held a press briefing that the number has been, has, there has been errors, and the actual number of people rescued stood at around 160, much less than the earlier figure, and that was due to double counting. And let's listen to what uh, the Vice Minister of the um, Ministry of Security and Public Administration had to say about this case. The reason for the confusion in the number of rescued people, the reason it was revised down from the earlier figure of 368 to the current 164, is because some of those who were rescued were counted twice. And any more updates on the cause of the accident? Of course, it's, there's not still clear as of now, but I have to note that this ferry was driven by a backup captain because the original captain was on vacation. And this backup captain uh, set off the ship later yeah. than the expected schedule, the, so the captain changed the route. And at the site of the crash, waters are 37 meters deep with lots of rocks in the area. However, the depths of the ship dipping into the water only stands at around 6 meters, so we cannot say for sure it was rocks that caused the accident. The ship was known to be made in 1994, and it's about 20 years old. The ferry went through a thorough checkup earlier this year, so further investigation is necessary to find out what caused this ferry sink. All right, Chiwon, thank you for that, and do keep us updated throughout the day. And we'll continue to monitor the... For the first time, Korea and Japan have sat down for working-level talks on resolving the so-called comfort women issue. It's a sensitive topic that has long driven a wedge between the two neighboring countries. But as our Hwang Sung-hee tells us, it will take much more than one meeting to mend decades of sour ties. Senior officials from Korea and Japan met in Seoul Wednesday as they seek to resolve the long-standing dispute over Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women. The rare meeting is the result of an agreement reached ahead of President Park Geun-hye's first official talks with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in the Netherlands last month. Korea is expected to reiterate its demand for an official apology and legal compensation from Japan for the so-called comfort women. Tokyo claims the issue was settled through a 1965 treaty signed by the two neighbors when they normalized diplomatic ties. But a report by Kyodo News Agency Wednesday on a meeting between Japanese and Korean officials in Tokyo in February suggests a shift in Japan's attitude. At the meeting, Japan reportedly said it wants to resolve the comfort women issue before next year, which is the 50th anniversary of the two countries normalizing their diplomatic ties. The report also said the Japanese government is reviewing various humanitarian measures, including providing government support funds for the victims and an official apology by the Japanese ambassador to Korea. Tokyo is reportedly even mulling the possibility of issuing a letter to the comfort women under the prime minister's name. Around 200,000 women, mostly Korean, were forced to serve the Japanese army in comfort stations during the early 20th century. But most agree that just one round of talks will not be enough for the two neighbors to overcome decades of diplomatic tensions. Hwang sang Arirang News. While Korea and Japan began talks on the sexual slavery issue, the surviving victims demanded justice outside the Japanese embassy here in Seoul, as they have been doing each and every Wednesday since 1992. Our Yuri was there and filed us this report. Shouts ring out, calling on Japan to atone for its sexual enslavement of women during World War II. Every Wednesday for the past 22 years, victims of the atrocities carried out by Japan relive their painful past here, in front of the Japanese embassy in Seoul. 
Ahead of the first ever governmental meeting between Korea and Japan on the issue of so-called comfort women, a euphemism for sex slaves, the victims were cautiously optimistic. All we want is the Japanese government to recognize its wrongdoings, apologize and provide legal compensation. But we will have to wait to see what they really have in mind. Civic leaders were concerned that the meeting was simply a show put on by the Japanese government, wary about its strained relationship with the United States in recent months. We will have to see if the Japanese government came to seek resolution or only came because of pressure from Washington ahead of President Obama's visit to Japan and Korea next week. I hope it's the former. With hopes running high, the former comfort women were joined by supporters at the rally. Even the idea of using comfort women is unacceptable. That is the universal opinion. I plead as a Japanese citizen that Japan apologize and make sure such things never happen again. The South Korean government should not give a lukewarm response, but rather make strong demands on behalf of these comfort women. Only 55 Korean women identified as former sex slaves remain alive today. But the doors to the Japanese embassy remain closed to their calls for justice. The ignorance of the Japanese government is becoming ever harder to bear for the victims who have grown frail from decades of waiting. Time is running out. Yurian, Arirang News. April's first plenary session opened on this Wednesday with lawmakers passing Korea's long-awaited defense cost-sharing pact with the U.S. Over in Washington, high-level officials from the two countries discussed the timing of the U.S. handing over the wartime operational control to Korea. Our Chim young gil reports. The ruling and opposition parties came together to pass a number of long-pending bills this Wednesday at the National Assembly. After months of gridlock, lawmakers passed the revised defense cost-sharing pact with the U.S. Seoul and Washington had agreed in January to renew the special measures agreement that lays out the cost each side pays for the 28,500 U.S. troops stationed on South Korean soil. Under the deal, South Korea will pay some 880 million U.S. dollars annually from this year through 2018, a 5.8 percent increase from its share last year. Approval of the pact was delayed over concerns that it requires Seoul to pay more than is necessary. The main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy had expressed the most concern, wondering aloud whether Washington would divert some of Seoul's share of the money to finance the relocation of a U.S. military base in the country. The ratified bill will go into effect after being signed by President Park Geun-hye. Over in Washington, South Korea and the U.S. opened a high-level military meeting at the Pentagon on Tuesday local time, with North Korea and pending alliance issues topping the agenda. The two-day integrated defense dialogue began with Seoul requesting for another delay in the transfer of wartime operational control from the U.S. to South Korea. Seoul is currently scheduled to regain wartime operational control in 2015, but the government says the nation's military needs more time to prepare for the transfer. The two sides have reportedly agreed in principle on a delay due to the ongoing threat posed by North Korea, but the exact timing and other details are still being ironed out. The two allies will sit down with Japan for defense trilateral talks starting Thursday. Kim young Adirang News. The top nuclear envoys of China and the U.S. have wrapped up their second day of talks in New York on ways to resume the long-stalled six-party talks on denuclearizing North Korea. Both sides are playing their cards close to their chest in regards to the details, but Washington says the dialogue has been productive. Kim ji has the details. Chinese nuclear envoy Wu Dawei and his U.S. counterpart Glenn Davies met for the second time this week to discuss ways to lure North Korea back to the six-party talks on its own denuclearization. In a statement Tuesday, the U.S. State Department said the talks had been productive and both sides had agreed on the fundamental importance of a denuclearized North Korea. The Chinese delegate did not comment about the closed-door meeting. Diplomatic sources in the United Nations were paying close attention to whether Wu would propose an arbitration plan on the human rights issue in North Korea. 
Pyongyang threatened to conduct a fourth nuclear test if the international community crossed the line by bringing up the regime's human rights abuses. The Chinese delegation spent five days in Pyongyang last month and has reportedly drawn up an arbitration plan that contains the North Korean stance on the matter. Wu and Davies will hold the third and last meeting in Washington on Friday. The meeting comes as Beijing's foreign ministry issued a rare statement to say, saying it's opposed to any move that may result in tensions in the region, whether they be joint drills between South Korea and the U.S. or North Korea's threat of conducting further nuclear tests. It also urged all related parties to make joint efforts to ease the situation and said China would continue to play a positive role in promoting peace and stability in the region. The six-party talks made up of South Korea, China, the U.S., Russia and Japan were suspended after North Korea walked out of them in 2008. Kim ji Arirang News. Rigorous spending aimed at revitalizing the local economy was on the mind of Korea's top economic policymaker during a regular meeting on this Wednesday. Our economic correspondent Nayeon Gyeong reports. Finance Minister Hyun Oh Seok says the government will accelerate its rate of spending in the first half of the year to help boost Korea's economy and make people actually feel the effects of improving economic conditions. Second quarter spending will be expanded to exceed the original first half of the year guideline of 55 percent. The money will be spent with a special focus on supporting the nation's small and mid-sized firms, so that 60 percent of the year's budget allocated for the finance sector is used in the first half of the year. The government executed 24 percent of its finance budget in the January to March period, that's slightly below its target of 28 percent. The finance minister is now pushing to spend what was left over in the first quarter, plus more than its 27 percent target for the second quarter. Hyun, while stressing Korea's economy is on a path of moderate recovery, emphasized that external uncertainties such as the U.S. stimulus scale back and the slowdown in the Chinese economy should be closely monitored, and he also pledged to spur domestic investment. The government will continue to make sure its $28 billion investment project is run as planned throughout the year. The project consists of 19 tasks aimed at easing regulations on restricted properties and utilizing them to secure investment, for example, for building company towns and special economic zones. Dae hyun Arirang News. Korea's biggest companies say they're committed to hiring more women, but the data suggests otherwise. According to analysis of regulatory filings from Korea's top 20 companies, female workers accounted for just 17 percent of their workforce last year, up just three percentage points from a decade earlier. At some companies like Samsung Electronics and LG Display, the ratio of female workers even dropped. The data indicates that internet-based firms appear to be more apt to hire women than manufacturing companies. As a means to boosting employment, small and mid-sized Korean companies that create more full-time jobs will be exempt from an annual tax audit. The National Tax Service says that the incentive will be for companies with revenue of less than 28 million U.S. dollars and particularly for those hiring young people. The government on Tuesday also unveiled a set of other measures to tackle the nation's low youth employment rate, which stood at 39.7 percent last year, far below the OECD nation's average of 50 percent. Companies will have their benefits removed if there's any sign of tax evasion. It's time to check on stories making headlines on the global front from the launch of an anti-terror operation in Ukraine to the mass abduction of students in Nigeria. We go live to our Paul Lee at the News Center. Paul, let's start with Ukraine. Kiev is pushing back pro-Russian groups in eastern part of the country. What are the latest developments there? Ukraine's acting president Oleksandr Turchinov said Tuesday that special forces have retaken a military airfield in the eastern town of Kramatorsk. 
Authorities say it marks the first formal military action by Kiev against pro-Russian militants that have occupied government buildings in 10 eastern regions this past week. Witnesses say Ukrainian troops, helicopters and several armored personnel carriers have been deployed to other key flashpoints. Despite reports of gunfire, there have been no confirmed casualties. Pro-Russian separatists remain in control of buildings in the city of Donetsk and Slavyansk. Moscow has condemned Kiev for the latest military operation, saying Ukraine is on the brink of civil war. Meanwhile, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has urged against using any force ahead of four-way talks on Thursday between diplomats from Russia, the EU, the U.S. and Ukraine. Well, let's hope the situation there can be resolved without any further loss of life. Turning now to China, where official data has been released on the country's economic growth rate for the first quarter. Paul, what was the final tally? The Chinese economy grew 7.4 percent in the January to March quarter compared to the same period a year earlier. That's slightly higher than market expectations of 7.3 percent, but it still represents the slowest growth rate in 18 months for the world's second largest economy. But authorities have rolled out any major stimulus measures in order to fight what they called short-term dips. A spokesman for China's National Statistics Bureau said Wednesday that the Q1 growth stayed within a reasonable range and showed that the domestic economy still faces downward pressure. Economists are split over Beijing's economic outlook. Some analysts say China's GDP growth will continue to lose momentum through 2014 unless the government takes greater steps to stabilize the economy. And lastly, let's focus on Nigeria. The country has been hit with a series of kidnappings and violent attacks in just the past few days. Paul, can you tell us who is responsible? Well, Nigeria's president, Goodluck Jonathan, is pointing the finger at the Islamic militant group Boko Haram, which is active in the northeastern region where these acts of violence have been concentrated. As many as 200 teenage girls were abducted by heavily armed men late Monday night at a boarding school in the state of Borno. Suspected Boko Haram gunmen engaged in a firefight with soldiers guarding the school, killing two, before loading the girls into trucks, vans and buses. Over 170 houses were burnt down in the attack. Earlier in the day, a massive bomb exploded at a bus station in the capital city of Abuja. The rush hour blast has killed at least 71 people and wounded 124 others. Officials say Boko Haram fighters have killed more than 1,500 civilians this year alone. Yusung? All right, Paul, thanks for that update, and we'll see you back here in just about two hours. Rescue operations over at Chindo will get more difficult with showers and strong winds forecast for tomorrow. And here in Seoul, an ultra fine dust warning has been issued. For details, we connect live to our Kim Bogyang standing at the Weather Center. Hi, Bogyang. Well, you saw the temperatures of seas at the accident site is at around 11 degrees. On average, a person can survive in such an environment for two hours. Making matters worse, rain is forecast on Chindo, and the rain will be accompanied with strong winds blowing at, at around 8 meters per second. Also, the tide will be at 2.5 meters, which is about 1.5 meters higher than today. Here in the capital, as of 5 p.m., an all Ultra fine dust warning was issued. Currently, Seoul is seeing 187 micrograms per cubic meter, which is about four times the normal levels. Chuncheon is at 176 micrograms, and Chinju is getting about 126 micrograms. So, children and the elderly must refrain from doing outdoor activities. Looking ahead at our current conditions, the nation is gradually will gradually be at the edge of a high pressure front, which is why we're seeing cloudy skies down south. 
through later tonight, Jeju is forecast to get about 5 millimeters of total precipitation. The showers will spread throughout the country by tomorrow with Jeolla, Namdo and both Gyeongsangdo provinces forecast to get between 10 to 40 millimeters of precipitation. Elsewhere in the central regions can expect less than 5 millimeters. The showers will provide the much needed moisture to the dry air. Taking a look at tomorrow's readings, Seoul tops out at 22 degrees, Gwangju and Busan hit 17 and 19. Moving on to other regions, Jeju reaches 21 degrees, while Dokdo and Mount Kumgang make it to 13 and 10. Back to you, Yusan. Thank you, Pogyang. And those are the stories we're following at this hour. Join us again for the latest on the ongoing rescue operation from a sunken ship of Korea's southwestern coast on our next newscast at 10 p.m. Korea time.